going to ask you all just to mute your phones. And we're going to commence in prayer. Then we're going to start our Bible study tonight, all right? So, Father, we thank you. We honor you. We bless your holy name tonight. We believe that we are not here on our own accord. But we, dear Lord God, know we come together, dear Lord God. It is an opportunity, dear Lord God, for you to add value to us, oh Lord God. Your word declared that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, Lord God. And tonight, we will find that treasure, dear Lord God. We will unearth, dear Lord God, all the good things that you have placed in us through your word. And we believe tonight that when we find it, it will be put in a place where all can see it, dear Lord God. We will put it at the forefront tonight, dear Lord God. We will discuss and dive into leadership, dear Lord God. We will embrace our destiny. And as we know, destiny is not a decision. It's a discovery because you already have a plan for us. So whatever your plan is for us tonight, dear Lord God, we will take it, dear Lord God, as a piece of our destiny to add on to ourselves, oh Lord God. And when we know our destiny, we will lead ourselves better. We will be good stewards of the life that you've given unto us at our higher level. Because you know there is purpose. You have given us purpose in this season. So bless everybody, dear Lord God, that is listening to this. We pray, dear Lord God, blessing on our pastor and the whole Kingsway ministry and all of our members, and the whole body of Christ. We thank you. When it's all said and done, we will join with David. And as he said, it was the Lord's doing, and it was marvelous in our sight to be here tonight. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, may we all say amen. And I believe you said amen. Well, God bless you tonight. My name is Pastor Dennis Martin. And tonight we're going to continue in Bible study. And again, we want to thank you on behalf of Pastor Brown that you continue to allow us to be a part of your spiritual development. And for the, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking a little bit about leadership. And I know you're here on this call and everybody who's watching on different, on different mediums that leadership is important. And when we look at all the things that was given to the church, the Bible puts it clear that there's an area in the book of Romans that talks about what God, what gifts God gave to the church. And then in the book of Corinthians, Corinthians, specifically Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about what the Holy Spirit gave as gifts to the church. And then when we look at the book of Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about the gifts that Jesus gave to the church. And those were not special gifts in terms of talents, but those were office gifts. There were levels of leadership. The Bible talks about in Ephesians chapter 4 about the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, teacher. Those are gifts, but they're not actual talent gifts. To be a pastor is not a talent. It's a, those are levels of authority. And the Bible says, that according to the book of Ephesians, that Christ had to go down to hell and bring them back up, bring them back up and give it back to the church. So tonight we want to talk about leadership and, and try to carry it out for a couple of weeks, try to unearth some things. And my aim and my desire as usual is to add value to you, to make sure you live your best life now. And if you truly believe that God has, put a, has placed a treasure inside your earthly vessel, it is to your best interest that you exercise good self-leadership. Before you lead other people, self-leadership is key. And when you lead yourself well, God will allow certain places and certain doors to be open for you. Not singular doors, but double doors. Double doors are places that open up to grand spaces. And I believe that as long as you are good with leading yourself, you will be able to lead others well. So as a father and as a husband, I have to exercise good self-leadership. I will never lead my family well. You have to lead yourself well. That is called the law of buy-in. People won't buy into what you're doing unless you... I'm going to ask everybody to keep their phones muted. <laughs> but um, as long as you, you know, lead yourself well, People will buy into you, and then they'll buy into your vision. So that's what they call the law of buy-in. So when you lead yourself, you're enhancing the law of buy-in for your 
yourself. You'll have people believe in you more because they see how you carry yourself. They see how you carry the vision and the thing that you hold dear. For, for, it doesn't have to be a ministry. It could be your family. It could be your own, your own self. You have to care for yourself well. And, and when you care for yourself well, a lot of people will buy into you better. I realize when I carry myself better, my children listen to me better. Hello. As they grow older, because remember, they're not getting younger. They're getting older. They will see certain things. They will hear you say certain things. And they want to make sure, like we talked about last week, about Jesus being the living word, that we are able to exhibit what we say. So tonight, you know, we're going to get into a story. And I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 39. And we're going, to talk, we're going to look at Joseph. And it's a long read. I'm going to do my best not to take it too long to read. But for context sake, I'm going to read the whole, not the whole chapter, but a good portion, you know, of the text. We're going to talk about some self-leadership first. And then we're going to extract those things out of the text. And at the end of the day, we'll come to a, a good place. And at the end of the day, the aim is to add value to you so that you can live your best life now. Amen? So Genesis chapter 39, and I will be reading from the Message Bible. I just, for this story, I, I like the way how the Message Bible read it. So Genesis chapter 39, and I'm going to be reading from verse 1 to verse 23. And the, and the scripture reads, after Joseph had been officials and the manager of his household bought him from them. As it turned out, God was with Joseph and things went very well with him. He ended up living in the home of his Egyptian master. His master recognized that God was with him, saw that God was working for good in everything he did. He became very fond of Joseph and made him his personal aid. He put him in charge of all of his personal affairs, turning everything over to him. From that moment on, God blessed the home of the Egyptian, all because of Joseph. The blessing of God spread over everything he owned, at home and in the fields. And all Potiphar had to concern himself was, with was, was eating three meals a day. Imagine you had an employee in your house that took care of everything. The only thing you needed to worry about was for everything else concerning your own affairs. The person was handling it. Joseph had good leadership skills. Joseph, according to verse 6 and 7, Joseph was strikingly handsome. As time went on, his master's wife became infatuated with Joseph and one day said, sleep with me. He wouldn't do it. He said to his master's wife, look, with me here, my master doesn't give a second thought to anything that goes on here. He puts me in charge of everything he owns. He treats me as an equal. The only thing he hasn't turned over to me is you. You're his wife, after all. How could I violate his trust and sin against God? Talk about credibility. She pestered him day after day after day. But he stood his ground. He refused to go to bed with her. On one of these days, he came to the house to do his work. And none of the household servants happened to be there. She grabbed him by his cloak, saying, sleep with me. He left his coat in, his, in her arms and ran out of the house. When she realized that he had left his coat in her hand and ran outside, she called to her house servants, look, this Hebrew shows up. And before you know it, he is trying to seduce us. He tried to make love to me, but I yelled loud as I could. With all my yelling and screaming, he left his coat beside me and here ran outside. She kept his coat, she kept his coat, she kept his coat right there until his master came home. She told him the same story. She said, the Hebrew slave, the one you brought to us, came after me and tried to use me for his plaything. When I yelled and screamed, he left his coat with me and ran outside. When the master heard his wife's story, tell, 
telling him, these are the things your slave did to me. He was furious. Joseph's master took him and threw him into jail where the king's prisoners were locked up. But there in jail, God was still with Joseph. He reached out in kindness to him. He put him on good terms with the, with the, with the head jailer. The head jailer put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. Trust me, when you're a leader, you can't run for it. People will just put things into your hand. The head jailer gave Joseph free reign, never even checked on it because God was with him. Whatever he did, God made sure it worked out for the best. Now, when we look at this story, according to Joseph, the story in the book of Genesis about Joseph, Joseph, at the beginning of his, as a young man, had favor. His father favored him. He gave him a cloak of many colors. His brothers were jealous of him. They decided to put him in a pit because the dream Joseph had that said that, okay, then eventually everybody else would be subordinated to him. They would worship him, even his parents. And being the youngest child, a lot of his siblings didn't like him. So therefore, they, they took the time and they put him in a pit. They, some were planning, some of the brothers were planning to kill him. But one of his older brother, which is named Judah, said, what profit would it be for us to just kill him? There is a caravan coming. Let's sell him to the caravan. So least that way we can get something out of it. It's amazing how in the New Testament, there was a guy named Judas, who was, which is similar to the name of Judah. Their names are similar, Judah and Judas. Their identities in scriptures are different. But it's amazing how the two of these brothers both had money on their mind and ready to, ready to sell out their brother for a change. But Joseph, you know, despite what he went through, still had God's presence with him. And though he was rejected and gone through all these things, because everybody who bought him gave him away, even when we read it in Potiphar's house, he bought him and gave him away. He didn't, it, it didn't phase the hand of God and the presence of God in his life. Despite the, 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 the turmoil and the bitterness and the betrayal that Joseph experienced, he always maintained a level of integrity. And I'm saying this to say that that it doesn't matter in your Christian walk what you experience in your life. Always exhibit a high level of integrity. People could throw you away, but don't allow their actions of, of mistreating you cause you to throw away the presence of God out of your life. It doesn't matter if people hate you. We, we're, we're mature enough as believers to know that. It doesn't matter who comes and go in your life. Jesus promised to be your Alpha and Omega. People will always, but Jesus was the one that promised that he would never leave you nor forsake you. And it didn't matter what Joseph experienced in his life. He always stick to who he was. Always stick to who he was. And even in terms of his leadership, and that's what makes a credible leader. There are some things that we're going to talk about because when you're, again, when you are a mother, you are a leader. When you are a father, you are a leader. When you are an elder sibling, you are a leader. Leadership is influence. It is influence. And it doesn't matter if you may not be the biggest CEO, you have influence. The Bible said that we are the salt of the earth. It is our job to influence the earth. That's why he said that we are the ones to have dominion upon it. We were supposed to be able to subdue it. In the Hebrew, to subdue means to bend back into shape. Because somewhere down the line, God knew that the world will, at times will be, would go out of order. And he commissioned us to keep things in place. We are called to be leaders. And if there's ever a time you didn't know, I'll be the first pastor to tell you the truth, that you are a leader, and it, and it is a capacity that we need to grow into. Nobody is born, a lead, is born a leader. They are developed into a leader. You go through things. Sometimes you have to stay under 
another leader to help you develop your leadership skills. Joseph was a leader and he was in Potter's first house. But I'm going to read a couple of things up about leadership before we get into the Potiphar story so that when we get into the story and then extract certain things out of the text, we know what to look for because we know what credible leadership is. The importance of credibility for leadership. That means that they, they are believed. When you are a credible leader, that means you are believed and that means that you are trusted both in the specifics of what you say and, and in generally as people. First, credible leaders are consistent in their words and in their behaviors. You got to be consistent in what you say and what you do. I'll say it again, to be a credible leader, which is synonymous to say an awesome parent, a great older sibling. Because remember, leadership is something that you don't turn on and off, and leadership is influence. It is influence. And for you to be a credible leader or whatever it, it, it synonymously, synonymously means into your own personal life, you have to be consistent in your words. You got to be consistent in your behaviors. Good in course or reversing in their decisions. Plan A was plan A for a reason. You don't need a plan B. You know it didn't work somewhere down the line, it wasn't executed properly. And if plan A was the best plan, the best thing to do is not to take the, the second best plan. Go back and look and see if you executed the best plan properly. And good leadership recognizes those things. In your home, if you have a family plan, you have a financial plan and you figure out, okay, it's not working, let me try this. Don't dumb down the plan. You could probably change the plan, but don't dumb down the vision. Good, credible leaders, they stick with it. They may change their plan. It may seem like I'm contradicting what I'm saying, but I'm not. You just, you just don't change your vision. But at the end of the day, because of our humanity, sometimes we can make mistakes in executing things. And if we're honest with ourselves, the problem wasn't the plan. The problem was us. Let's look at it and see where I made my mistake in executing plan A and try to do it better. Because plan A was plan A for the reason. You hear what I'm saying? We don't go back on our decisions. We don't go back and forth. Why? Because you're a leader. People have to follow you. People are waiting on you. So always remember, in terms of being a credible leader, you got to walk the walk and talk the talk and make your actions speak louder than your words as well. And you have to be a person that delivers on your promises. Because if we question the messenger, we will not believe the message. And that's for me as a pastor. But even for us as parents as well, with our children, we got to be have we got to have a high level of cred credibility for our children. We must lie to them. We should be consistent with our children. Have to be when you can't do it, say from the beginning you can't. And if they don't understand, then don't worry. God made it very well, worked it out well that they are not getting younger; they're getting older. Father along, they will understand why. Promises you can't keep. You got to be able to be a person that delivers with their promises. Leaders with leaders with established credibility are respected and trusted. Now, here's a couple of lists. Here's a list of a couple of things I had that are some good traits and qualities for leaders that you know that want to become very credible for the people that are, you know, working with them. You gotta be respectful. You gotta be respectful. Credible leaders don't insult. Not in front of people, nor behind their backs. Because what people don't see, God still sees. And he will hold you against it. He will. So this level of being credible is not only for the eyes of men, 
but it's also for the eyes of God. It doesn't make no sense you try to do things to accommodate the eyes of man. And in the last days, man is not going to be the ones who are going to be, who's going to be judging you. Make sure in regards to your children, in regards to your husband, in regards to your wife. Remember, it doesn't matter what capacity you are in this world. You are a leader. Especially when you acknowledge the fact that responsibility has been delegated to you. You have to pay your bills. There's some children that you may have. You got to exhibit, you know, a good degree of leadership. You got to lead yourself well. Lead yourself well. The Bible said that you are a treasure. And if you know that God has placed a treasure in you, self-leadership is really the caretaking of the treasure that God has placed in you. So therefore, you can't be disrespectful to people. Why? Because people are the pinnacle of God's creation. Hello. Paul even said, who are you to speak ill of another man's servant? You cannot speak ill against the people of God because they don't own you. God gave us, the, you don't own them. God gave us dominion over the earth and the creepy things. He gave us dominion over stuff, not people. Not people. So therefore, we as, as good leadership, you ought to be a person that respects people. Secondly, there's seven of them. You have to be honest. Credible people are, are transparent with their actions. You got to be honest. You have to be honest. And without, you know, transparency, you will never find a high level of compatibility, compatibility with the people who you're working with. Because they don't know who you are. So you, you kind of make yourself a little bit difficult to entreat. You have to be honest. Credible leaders are educated. They know the benefits of always increasing their learning. To be a good leader, you always have to be the student and to always increase your learning. Because the day I'm a teacher, I'm a counselor. The day I stop learning is the day I plateau my ministry. And then eventually, if I plateau, I will be somewhat no good to others, those who God has blessed me to aid in their Christian walk. So I always have to be a student. A credible leader, a good leader, are people who always educate themselves. And they're competent. They have stuff. They're competent. The fruit of a good education is competence. You, you are competent. A good leader, so a good parent is competent. You're knowledgeable. You have to make sure that you are competent and educated. So when your children ask you for advice, you can give it. You can give it. You're competent of life. You're competent of finances. It's not about if you never made a mistake. Don't worry. You're the parent. They're your children. Your mistakes will be their wisdom. As long as you stay credible, when you talk about your mistakes, they will listen to you because you are honest in front of them. That's why it's very, very key that as a parent who is, who is, I think, is the greatest form of leadership is a parent that, you know, you stay honest in the eyes of your children because as long as you're rearing them up good based off of the advice because they listen to you because you stay credible for them, it gives us a brighter future for tomorrow. So you have to be competent and that you are also accountable. Good leadership doesn't need, to, doesn't need other people to tell them when they're wrong. You're supposed to know. And not feel like it takes anything away from you. I'm not afraid to that my mistakes will be my children's wisdom. And as a believer, the Bible tells us already, we know that in the end we win anyways. So there's no such things in life for the believer as win or lose. It's either win or there's a lesson learned. And then there's a lesson 
learned, thank God for grace. It could be wisdom for my children tomorrow. It could be wisdom for my children tomorrow. So you got to be accountable. Good leaders take full responsibility for their actions and their decisions. These leaders accept when they make a mistake and do everything that is needed to amend it in a prompt manner. This is good leadership talk. This one, a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about some leadership stuff so that way you can be the best version of you as we go through this pandemic and do it well to maintain it. They are loyal, credible leaders, remain true to themselves and watch out for their interests and watch out for the interests of others. These leaders are supportive and really care about people. This is what helps gain reciprocal loyalty. So to be a good leader, you gotta be loyal. You gotta be loyal to those who are loyal to you. You got to be loyal. Loyalty is key. And people will see it. My pastor tells me all the time that people don't care to know how much they, you know. They care to know how much you care. And it, it sticks with me. It resonates with me to know that I may not know everything. And that, and that doesn't disqualify me to be a good leader. But at least the members and the fellowship know that I care. I care. And anything I don't know, because I care, I take the time to educate myself and make sure I'm competent. Because without love, as the Bible puts it, we cannot, we cannot accomplish anything. And leadership without love, it'll be hard for you to accomplish something. Because when you're not able to do a thing, or you're not the right type of person to do a certain thing, you need to upgrade yourself for it. Understand this. Any upgrade to yourself as a leader, it's not really for you, it's for the people. And if you don't truly love the people, you will be always reluctant to do the necessary things to upgrade yourself. This is why in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it teaches us that, you know, without love, we won't accomplish much. Love is the driving force of all ministry. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about spiritual gifts that is given to us through the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14 talks about the, the, the proper use of, of tongues and interpretation. But chapter 13 talks about how we maximize our ministry through love. I know we use it for weddings and everything like, like that, but that's not the real context for it. It talks about how love maximizes my spiritual gift and my spiritual office. And when you are loyal to, your, to, to those who you are working with, Notice how, I, notice how I say though to those who are working for you, no. Who you're working with. True leaders understand that you're not a manager. The manager will say, hey, you guys are down on sales. But the coach that plays basketball, who's not even playing in the game, will look at his team and say, hey, we are down by 10. He includes himself in it. And sometimes the Moses leadership is good. It can get you out of leisure. It can get you out of Egypt. But staying up in that mountaintop away from the people is no good. When you're up there for so long, they'll end up making a calf behind your back. You need a leadership like Joshua, which his name is similar to Jesus Christ. Which is which which their leadership is different. It is Joshua's leadership is down to earth with the people. You ever notice Joe? You'll never read the scripture about Joshua going up on no mountaintop to go get some word from God. He stayed down with the people. Stayed down with the people. It's very, very necessary that even as myself as a pastor where the Bible uses the analogy of the shepherd. Don't let nobody fool you. Real shepherds are supposed to smell like sheep. Hello, people. We have to have a healthy balance of the distancing of leadership and also the necessary, you know, thing of being amongst them. This is why Jesus was a high priest that came down and, and, and stayed with us. 
according to the book of Hebrews, his ministry is effective because he stayed with the people. That's what made him an adequate high priest for us. So even sometimes as a parent, I realize I have a 16-year-old. I realize now it's not all the time do as I say. At that age, I'm somewhat borderline as the life, the life coach for him. And sometimes it's not always about do as I say. I ask him, what, he, what does he think about it? Just so I can understand his rationale. And if he makes a, a mistake, I am loyal to him to get him out of it. Because I made mine. And there are some things that they will need to learn off of their own mistakes. Some things, not all things. Heaven help them if it's all things. But sometimes you allow them to experience certain things so that way you can see where their rationale is at. As a parent, it is good when they reach that age. You allow them to go through certain things so you can see how mature they are. And lastly, credible leaders, they are trusted. Credible leaders are confident about the abilities of the people and know how to delegate effectively. Good leadership trusts people when they invest in them. Whenever there is a doubt, that is an indication of where you have not invested. That's why you're somewhat uncomfortable. But if you truly have children and you've been teaching them every Saturday, Rather than letting them play their video games in the morning, say, hey, come here, let me teach you how to cook this. Come here, let me show you how to clean. Come here, let me show you how to do your laundry. If you don't trust them to do your laundry, it's an indication that you have not trained them. And a lack of trust speaks about how poorly you have invested in them. So to be a credible leader, you got to trust. But again, you can't trust where you haven't invested. So always, you have to invest in those who are working with you. And don't let nobody tell you different. I'll tell you the greatest secret you could ever know. Investing in your team is a form of self-investment because they are the extension of you. They are the extension of you. I invest in my children and every domestic thing. We're going to get into the text, but we want to be able to see these things in the text. So it's good that we talk about it first. So when we get into the story, we can see it. So all I'm doing is just enhancing your perception. This will not be long. In this area, I want to spend the most time. The scripture won't take long because we're, we're fixing our eyes to see what we need to see. So then as a leader now, I'm able to trust my, those in my household. I could tell one son, hey, go do the laundry. And I trust him to do it because I have invested in him to do so. I have showed them how to do it. I have spent time with them to do it. The other one, I can say, you can do this and do that. It's all, always remember. And then when they're doing that, I can relax. <laughs> because when you invest in your team, it's a form of self-investment as well. They are the extension of you. They are the extension of you. When we look at the story of Joseph, now, Joseph's life was a life of constant dilemma and rejection. If he never had good leadership skills, self-leadership skills for himself, his life would have made his self-perception a mess. Listen to me. The Bible said that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. But the dilemma sometimes in life is this. How I was made and how I was raised could clash. And how I, I was raised is synonymous to my life experiences as well. If Joseph allowed his life experiences to supersede his mindset of knowing that how he was made, which is particular, the dream that he had in particular, his life could have been totally different. Look where he ended up. All he knew that he was destined to go to the palace. He did not know that he didn't have to, he, he wasn't going to go through the front door. He would be going into the palace from the prison at the bottom. 
Joseph's life was a life of, of starting from the bottom and working his way up. And in life, life is like that. In a city, they have many prisons. But the worst of criminals, their prison is always in the castle, at the bottom, what they would call the dungeon. That's where that was his entryway uh, into the castle. For some of us, it will not be the front door. At least it's not the back door. But always remember in life, God's providence is sure. And all you need to do is just to ensure that you lead yourself well. Govern yourself well. It doesn't matter what stage you go through life, whatever life throws at you, make sure you're a good caretaker of you. Joseph was sold by his brothers. Then the same caravan that bought him sold him to somebody else. You'd be surprised in the midst of all of that rejection, you would think Joseph would have a lack of value for himself. Because like I said, knowing how and why you were made by God could clash with how you were raised, your life experiences. I already know. We all know we're believers. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We're not no rushed thought with, for God. God took time to make you. But life experience is special about me. But you got to believe that there's something special about you. And the moment you believe that there's something special about you, that will enhance and fortify your consciousness to exercise good self-leadership. Self-leadership, because self-leadership is the reinforcement of the good thing that God has placed in you. You, are, you take care of yourself well, because you know that there's something well inside of you. There's a treasure there. Something that is in value, that's something that has value in a box. You don't just drop it on the floor. You put a sign and say it's fragile. You care for it. You put it somewhere nicely where it won't fall. So you cannot allow the, your experiences in life, the betrayal, the frustration, sometimes the failures, because Joseph's life was played with it, but, it all, but he held on to his promise. He held on to his promise, and he didn't carry himself like a reject. Don't carry yourself like a reject. Carry yourself well. It doesn't matter if it's the one shirt you have. Press it. My grandma used to tell me, say, if it's the one shirt you have to come to church with, make sure it's clean, ironed, and you carry it to church and you leave. Carry yourself well. Joseph was constantly being rejected, but he didn't carry himself as if he was rejected. If he was in prison, he was in prison with integrity. When he was sold out by his brothers, when you study the story of Joseph, he even then showed them back love. Because you cannot allow the wickedness of other people dictate who you need to be. It's like we said last time, when you think you're trying to get even, you're not getting even at all. You give me $5 American, I give you $5 Canadian. Did I pay you back? No, it's different value. And sometimes for people to do wickedness to you, it costs them nothing. And I'm not saying that. The Bible says that. The Bible says there are people out there that don't sleep until they do mischief. The Bible even says that you're not even supposed to eat bread from them. Don't eat the bread from, of wicked men. They were wicked to him. And yet he showed mercy and compassion to them when he got to the place where he was a governor. You cannot always go evil for evil eye for an eye, try to get even because it will cost you more to go back and do evil back to other people than it costs them to do it for you. Why, Pastor Dennis? It's simple, because your journey is different. Some people say good people finish last. Not necessarily. It depends on what kind of race you're running, my friend. It, it, it depends on what type of journey you're on. Some of these people, they're on a different level. You're on a different level. They're doing long jump and you're doing a marathon. Your journey is different. And for you to be you and to discard that 
Because to do the wickedness back to them, it's not about you doing a thing. It's about you becoming a thing. Because your aim is to be like Christ. You're sidestepping that to become wicked. That's why I said it's more costly for you. Joseph never carried himself as if he was rejected. Sometimes in life, the rejections are also God's redirections in disguise. Every time that you have been rejected in life, this is self-leadership. You cannot allow the things you experience cause you to carry yourself a certain way. You got to carry yourself well. It doesn't matter what stage you are in life. And don't allow the rejections to steal your enthusiasm for God's plan for your life. Because you are still, regardless on how you are raised or whatever you experience, you are still fearfully and wonderfully made. So when we talk about, you know, self-leadership and leading yourself properly, it's so you know that there's a treasure in there. There's destiny inside of you. And it's a destiny you cannot drop. You got to carry yourself according to the destiny that God showed you. Write this one thing down. Destiny is not a decision. It's a discovery. You don't decide your destiny. Hello, people. You discover it. And when God reveals it to you, all your life, you must lead yourself accordingly to it in an integral fashion so when joseph found out he was called to be a leader because that's synonymous to say if people are going to bow down to you that means you're a leader you're a person of authority he carried himself in an integral fashion he carried himself with all these qualities it didn't matter what stage he was in life it didn't matter he what he encountered he never changed from the person he knew he needed to be because you, in the purest Christian form, cannot allow your environment, your earthly environment, to dictate who you need to be. Because as much as you are in the world, the Bible makes it abundantly clear. You are in Christ. How do you need to conduct yourself to stay in that environment? It is in Him you move and breathe and have your being. So you're as much as you probably think that you're in a, in a in, you're in you're in some form of government housing for some of for some people who think like that think that this is my lifestyle and this is the person who I have to be now. No, you are in Christ. If anybody asks me what's the position of the church, I will always tell people it's good because it's in Christ. It is in Him you move and breathe and have your being. So from the pit to the prison, Joseph conducted himself. Integri integrally and because he in in conducted himself integrally God was always with him you see how this all connects because you know you have a treasure in you you know you have destiny in you you know that you were fearfully and wonderfully made you had a dream your destiny was revealed to you you cannot allow how you were raised and all your life experiences dictate who you should be you have to lead yourself according to the destiny that was revealed to you, regardless of where you are. So if there's a phase in your life where you are a follower, continue to conduct yourself as a leader. Because before you become the thing, sometimes you have to act like you are the thing. Because it's in you. The promise is there. The destiny is there. And destiny, again, is not a decision. You can't say, well, I don't want to do this. No, a destiny, destiny is not a decision. It's a discovery. That's God's plan for your life. And at Kingsway, we want to love you back to life and destiny. And when we help you find that thing, we'll do our best, the best to our ability to make sure you become the person you need to be to walk in that thing. That comes through relationship. That comes from you availing yourself to, to forms and platforms like these. Because good leaders educate themselves. And Bible study is important. Discipleship training is important. We send our children to school 
to be professionals. And the teachers are not preaching to your children. They're teaching them. Teaching will always produce professionals. And this is why the devil will always fight the teaching ministry. Because that's what births professionals. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're growing up to be the apostle, the prophet, or the evangelist. Some point in your life, you had to sit under the teaching ministry. Teaching is important. As a, to be a great parent, don't be afraid to be mentored by other good parents. It's necessary. It helps, brings out the greatness in you to be under somebody who's been there and done that. Joseph, you know, he was, he embraced his journey. And he trusts his process. As a matter of fact, write that down. Embrace your journey. Trust your process. You continue to be the person you know you need to be, regardless of what life is throwing at you. Because sometimes in life, the process may seem greater than the prize. Jesus felt like that when he was in the garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if it can, if you please, let this cup pass. What is he trying to say? He's trying to say, this process seems greater than my price. What I'm going through right now seems greater than what you showed me. Because Jesus even said to his disciples, I will die. And then I will be risen up. And then I will be sitting at the right hand of the Father. So he knew his destiny. Make no mistake about it. Don't think Jesus knows your future and he didn't know his own. Because the because the Holy Spirit is an internal light. He will tell you more about yourself, if you allow him, more than the sins and the shortcomings of others. Because the Holy Spirit, the Bible said, he is your comforter. He is your aid. He's not your magnifying glass for other people. He is your inner light. Jesus knew his destiny. But he trusts the process. He said, not my will but your will be done. He didn't change his destiny. Because remember, destiny is not a decision. It's a discovery. And when you understand it, you got to walk that path and be the person you need to be to maintain it. And to be the person you need to be to maintain it, it will require you to exercise self-leadership. Self-leadership is the greatest form of leadership. It's the most important. It is the foundation of any other leadership skill. Because if we can't buy into you, we will not buy into what you are doing or saying. Not even your children. You cannot tell them, I feed you and I clothe you. You'll get the rudest awakening. Your children will look at you and say, I could get that treatment in prison. And some children will. They want to be able to see you exhibit what you say. And when you are at that level of being credible, as a leader within your home, when they need advice, they will come for you. Because that's what you want. You want to make sure that your your mistakes can be their wisdom, so they don't repeat them. They don't imagine that it didn't even need a prayer team to break a stronghold, to break a cycle, to break a cycle you see in your family. Just be credible, be credible, be consistent, and let them see that. And when they are about to walk in the same thing that you struggled with when you were younger, you will be able to advise them. And they will not, you will not lose their hearing because they respect you permissionally, not just only positional. They're not just listening to you because they're your parent, you're their parent. They're listening to you because they value what you say. So you got to remember, despite what you embrace, whatever you experienced in your life, you have to be the person that you need to be for your destiny. And to maintain that, you need to exercise self-leadership. And when you exercise self-leadership, you become a blessing to other people. Look at the life of Joseph. When he went into Potiphar's house, the house was blessed. And that's amazing. Because he led, he led his life in a fashion that God would never have to leave him. So the presence of God was with him. And that's a beautiful thing. Because that, when you're able to do that, the world becomes blessed. 
Because the Bible tells us in the, when there was a time when the Israel relied on the ark. Not Noah and the ark. The ark of the covenant. Well, it, was, it was a box that contained the Ten Commandments, the manna, and also Aaron's rod that budded. Israel believed that that, that box represented the presence of God. And when the, wherever that box was, victory came. Wherever that box went and the person properly appropriated it, the house was blessed. It's amazing the same way how the box was a blessing to a house is the same way Joseph was a blessing to another person's house. And the common denominator is that there was the presence of God in an in a, in a, in a item, in a box. The Bible said that you are also a vessel, eh? Hello, people. You are a vessel as well. So even then, the difference of the blessing of God when it's in a box and from when it's in a man is that the blessing reaches more people. You can enter more homes. You can reach out and bless other people. But to be that blessing, you have to be able to be a person like Joseph and lead yourself integrally. When you're able to lead yourself integrally and be consistent with the person you need to be, God will never leave you. Why wouldn't God leave you? Because you are not leaving the destiny that he gave you. You're not dropping it. You're becoming, you, you maintain being the person that God required you to be. And when he sits with you and he remains with you, wherever you go, you are a blessing. Imagine that. You, not, you don't only need to ask God for a blessing. You are a walking blessing. Wherever you go, you are a blessing to people. People who lead themselves well are people who bless people. You're a blessing to people when you lead yourself well, when you're able to conduct yourself accordingly, when you're able to, you know, trust people and all those other leadership qualities we were talking about before. You are a blessing to people. You have to understand that when you lead yourself well and you embrace your destiny because you, you're leading yourself well, you become someone's answered prayer. You become an answered prayer to somebody. Because whenever we talk about the blessing, it's not only about use for other people. God don't comfort you to make you comfortable. He comforts you to comfort somebody else. And sometimes bringing out the best version of you, it's all about being able to bless somebody else. Joseph was a blessing to everybody else. Joseph was a blessing to somebody, everybody else. And that was his ministry. Sometimes we over-spiritualize ministry. We think it's only on the pulpit. It's ministry. Joseph executed his ministry properly. And biblically speaking, statistically proven, he didn't even win one soul to the Lord. Because that was in his ministry. He wasn't the evangelist. Read your Bible. He was an answer to poverty. Joseph's ministry was a secular ministry. Secular is not mad. Secular just means outside of the church. Hello, people. There are such things as secular ministry. Sometimes we only think about secular music. Yeah, there is secular ministry, secular music. But there's also secular ministry outside of the church where God has used people to impact this world, which I believe the church still needs. We need people to embrace ministry in the corporate office, in the marketplace, in all these places where they, you know, show forth the glory of God in all those facets of life. Joseph's ministry was a secular one. So it was a secular one. He was an answer to poverty. And he did it well, though he never won one soul because that wasn't his assignment. He knew his assignment was to be a leader and he governed himself accordingly. Didn't matter what life presented to him. My question to you and my admonition to you is that you cannot allow life to dictate how you lead and govern yourself. Though Joseph was rejected on every level, he didn't carry his life as if he was rejected. 
He carried himself well. He was integral. He was still a blessing to every individual. And even though people did him bad, from his brothers to Potiphar's wife, you name it, he still chose to do good. It's always good to, do, to be on the high road. Nothing bad ever happened to anybody for doing that in the long run. In the long run in life. Just stay firm in who you need to be. Joseph was a leader. And before he was able to lead people, he had to exercise self-leadership first. If David never exercised self-leadership first, when he was in the cave and was, had an opportunity to kill Saul, he would have succumbed to the people. But people who lead themselves well are not easily manipulated by others. You hold strong to your vision. And a vision without integrity is no vision, no plan at all. It can't be by any means necessary. Because at the end of the day, you got to live with it. So David knew he was going to be a king, but he knew he wasn't going to be a king like that. Saul was still God's anointed, and David showed respect. He was integral. Joseph, in the like manner, was able to be accountable as well. He said, how am I going to do this sin against my God? He didn't even think about Potiphar, ultimately by itself. He recognized God has a plan for me. How can I forfeit God's, God's plan for my life by leading, and, and leading my life in this fashion? Don't allow people or the influences of others cause you to lower the standard of how you lead yourself because God's plan will surely come to pass. It will come to pass. And as long as you have that conviction, you will carry yourself accordingly, regardless what you experience, regardless of what you're going through. Always remember that when, when you are the presence of God, not inside of a box, but in a man, that you are God, you are God, blessing to other people. You have value. So carry yourself as if there's something great inside of you. Tonight, we're, we, I want you to know that you have something good inside of you. And we're going to dive into some deeper stuff in leadership. But tonight was something simple on self-leadership. And the only thing that can aid you in self-leadership, write this one down, first one, is the Holy Spirit. He aids you in self-leadership. The Bible says he will lead you in all truths. Not only about what you're supposed to have, but also who you are supposed to be. He will lead you in all truths. You cannot allow your experience to lead you. What is the Holy Spirit leading you to? What is the Holy Spirit saying who you're supposed to be? See, no, a lot of people don't want to hear that because you're saying, Pastor, well, that means I got to pray. Yeah, you got to pray. <laughs> Yeah, you got to spend time with God. This is discipleship teaching. You got to pray. And people who don't, who don't pray are people who don't want to be spirit-led. And you need to be spirit-led for your sake and for your family's sake. Because you are a leader. Leaders don't only have the position of authority. It's worse than that. They have the position of responsibility. God's going to ask you. Though Eve had her hand in what happened in the Garden of Eden, God never called for Eve. He asked the person who was in the position of responsibility. And when we have this leadership discussion, you'll always see me use that language more. Responsibility, not authority. It's not only authority. You have responsibility. Responsibility. Always remember, you have value. God is glorified through you. You are an instrument of God's blessing when you carry yourself properly. Because wherever you go, if you carry yourself properly, you will be a blessing to somebody. You will be somebody's answered prayer. 
and I don't care, not to sound insensitive, what you have experienced in your life. You cannot allow your experience, how you were raised, to supersede why and how you were made. You can't. Life will always have its thing that could derail you. But you got to understand the promises of God is forever sure. And whatever he said he will do, he will surely do. Just make sure you internally are in the right place and you are the right person when he decides to turn on what he's about to do. And that's in all platforms in the Christian life. Even in the coming of the Jesus of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We don't know when he's coming, but we have to make sure we are the people he needs us to be when he comes. So always remember in all my admonishment I gave you tonight in closing, you got to make sure you are the person you need to be. You got to make sure that you are the person you need to be. And by doing that, it's by leading yourself. Joseph went through a plenty of experiences in life, but he led himself well. He didn't allow his experience to dictate the, the, the climate and how he led it. He led himself. He led himself according to the promise God gave him, not his life experiences. You are not your life experiences. You failed your driver's test. So that means you're going to walk around and say you're a failure. No, that's an experience in your life. That is not who you are. Just the same way if I make a citizen's arrest, it doesn't make me a policeman. Just the same way if you sin as a believer, it doesn't make you a sinner because sin is not your practice. The Bible will always say you miss the mark. Never ever you take your life experiences and make that your identity. Don't even allow your identity to be hinged on people. Because when they leave, you give them the power to take a piece of you away. You are who God said you are. And you lead yourself regardless of what you've experienced. According to the destiny God has placed in you. So your homework tonight. I want everybody, before they go to bed, Old Testament style, face down, brain, asking the Lord to show you your destiny. What in destiny is your divine destination in God? Who are my destiny helpers to get there? Because I got to be that person before God releases them to me. Because God does hasten to perform his word. He's not leaving it all up to you. You don't even want that responsibility. The only responsibility you want is to be the person you need to be. Make sure you understand destiny is not a decision. You don't choose this. Go to God and ask him. And if you ask for a bread, he won't give you a stone. If you feel you need to fast for this, do it. It's very critical that in terms of you leading yourself properly, you know what you're leading yourself for. What is the identity I'm leading myself for? Who am I, God? What's your plan? And when you're able to know these things, then your self-leadership conviction will be a lot stronger. And then you will, be, you will be clear on your standards as well because you know whom God has called you to be at a personal level. Amen? So I'm going to pray tonight. I'm going to ask everybody just to bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you tonight. I present before you to be working with and being involved in the spiritual development of your blessed children. Tonight, we've, we are talking about self-leadership and about how it's important, Lord, that we don't allow our life experiences to dictate how we ought to carry ourselves. Because we've been cheated, we're not going to cheat others. Because we've been rejected, we're not going to treat ourselves as if we are damaged goods. We're still the righteousness of God. Your Bible declared in Matthew chapter 13 that the kingdom of heaven is like a person who lost treasure and hid it in the, or hid it in a field. We are hidden treasure. And tonight we're going to unearth it within ourselves. We're going to take the time tonight 
to pray and to seek your face about it. Because destiny is not a decision, it's a discovery. And we'll discover it tonight. And we will lead ourselves according to the plan that you have ordained for us. If you called us to be the head, we will lead ourselves and conduct it ourselves as if we are leaders, Lord God. Because we know it's in there. And we prayed as long as understanding that, as long as we understand our destiny and we know how to lead ourselves, I pray that you'll open the eyes of your children, that they may be able to see their destiny helpers when they come about, when they show up, when they reveal themselves. Because they won't be able to do it on their own. Joseph never got into the palace on the upper level on his own. He required the aid Father God, of somebody else that who remembered him to get, so he got the invitation to come up. We pray the Lord God that your people will know their destiny helpers. It may not be somebody great. It could be somebody with a newspaper, the Lord God, that is holding it and just gave it to them. And, if they, and from that, they saw an ad in the paper that made them see the, the, the job that they were destined for. They will not take anything lightly because in the spirit realm, we need to pay attention to details. We will be able to know the counterfeit of the enemy as well. Because to know real from counterfeit, we must be able to pay attention to detail. So widen our capacity, the Lord God, to focus in this season. Because we want to be able to lead ourselves well. And be able to be the people who you have destined us to be. I pray tonight for our pastor. We pray for the vision of Kingsway as well. You have given us the capacity to love people back to life and destiny. And we believe we can do it so by your grace. So be it on to your children tonight. Not because I have prayed it, but because it is according to your word. We believe it. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. If you believe that, just say amen. God bless you guys tonight. I'm sorry if I took a little bit long, but I wanted to make sure you know the importance of self-leadership. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank Hope you. to see you guys. Remember to, um, if you're here with us, remember our prayer call on Friday nights. That's the time when we come together and we pray as a church. If you have any prayer requests, just send it to admin at kclcministries.org. All right? Take care. God bless. Love you guys.